Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. Happy to be with you as always. I hope you're having a fabulous week so far. Wondering how your weekend went and how how your week is going. My weekend was quiet. It was so nice. It was so nice to have a quiet weekend. And I think I say that a lot, but this was a different kind of quiet weekend. We weren't in the office. We were actually at home hanging out with the dogs. So that was nice. Uh, We have been continuing our daily walks with the dogs and the weather has been great. It's been really windy the last two days. So crazy um, wind, but lovely weather. And we've been expanding our walk so that we are going further. Not sure the dogs appreciate that, but... um, we do, and I definitely enjoy the change of scenery and getting out of the office and going for a walk and soaking up some sunshine, etc. So, all in all, good weekend, good start to the week. It's just been very busy, lots and lots of meetings and lots and lots of projects that sometimes take longer than they should, but that's just the nature of the projects. At any rate, let's talk about books books plural. Uh, It's the first two books in a trilogy. It is described as steampunk or diesel punk or rust punk, all of which will be explained by the author in the interview. The trilogy is the Slick Dust trilogy. The author is Noah Lemelson. Let me give you the description of the first book in this series. The first book is called The Sightless City. The second book is called The Lioness and the Rat Queen. Um, The Sightless City. Kidnapping, enslavement, murder. Those are the only, those are only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to actions some will take to protect their interests in aether oil, the coveted substance that fuels the city of Wheel. As both veteran and private investigator, Marcel Talwar knows this firsthand and he likes to think he'd never pers- participate in such things. However, that naive idea comes to a crashing end when he takes on a new case that quickly shatters his worldview. A trail of evidence points to someone in Marcel's inner circle who's using him as a pawn to conduct grisly experiments. Experiments that could lead to genocide. Now Marcel is more determined than ever to discover who's pulling the strings to this sinister plot. But the further he gets, the larger the target on his back becomes. And it's not long before Marcel has to ask himself how much and how many he's willing to sacrifice to get to the truth. So again, that is the description of The Sightless City, first book of the Slick Dust trilogy. And there is a second book out. Currently, it is called The Lioness and the Rat Queen. Probably give you that description later after the first break. So you can have both of those if you're interested. Maybe you've already read the first one. Maybe you've read both of them. Maybe you haven't read either of them. So either way, you're getting a description of the first two books that are out. Um, I said at the end of the last episode that I didn't, that I I had an idea of, um, steampunk, diesel punk, wasn't sure about rust punk. I've already told you that Noah is going to explain what those mean in, in terms of his writing during the interview. And I think I've never read a lot of steampunk or diesel punk, not from lack of interest, just hasn't come across my reading list lately, but uh, I am intrigued. It feels, and I'm just saying I could be completely wrong, but what it feels to me like um, a combination of science fiction and fantasy. So science fiction elements with a little bit of magic thrown in, um, you know, you often have sort of old fashioned settings, but with more modern technology ish. That is a really, really simplified 
explanation. You're probably all cringing right now, but maybe you've never read much steampunk either and you're wondering what it is. So that's my attempt to kind of I shouldn't I shouldn't even be trying to explain it. You know what? We're just going to let Noah talk about the books because um they are he's created a really cool world. It's a little bit post-apocalyptic. It is a little bit um well this first this first book is more noir as he mentions and then the second book feels more uh, like a western setting so you get different kinds of settings um some things are going to feel familiar some things are not going to feel familiar he's done a great job of world building and creating some characters that are going to feel both um unique and familiar so uh, again slick dust trilogy author is noah lemelson let's get to that interview Hi, Noah. Welcome to the podcast. It's lovely to be here. I am happy to have you here. I am um, excited to talk about the first two books in a trilogy that you have, the Slick Dust Trilogy. But before we do that, if you would just take a few moments to share a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Sure. I'm Noah Lemelson. I'm a writer, teacher, writing instructor. Um, I like to write science fiction, fantasy, everything speculative, both short stories and long form. Uh, my background is actually in biology. That was my undergrad. But um, <clears throat> following graduation, uh, I, I started to slip more and more into writing, and it took up more and more time, and eventually I realized that's what I, what I love to do. Um, so I've been making my way as a writer since then. So does... A background in biology help you in terms of speculative fiction? Can you kind of lean on that science a little bit to bring that into what you write? Uh, I, yes, I think it it influences it definitely. Um, I've written some stories that uh, play with similar concepts as I was interested in studying. I was, you know, interested in evolution, ecology, and animal behavior. Um, so I've always been interested in what makes people tick from a very kind of uh, deep level. Um, so sometimes I write stories that uh, address science directly. Other times I go much more fantastical um, and just use my interests as a jumping off point. I'm also, um, I never studied history, but I'm very interested in history. It's something I'm always reading books, listening to podcasts, and that is also a massive influence in my uh, writings. Sure. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, well, the, as I said, the, this is a trilogy that you are working on. The first two books are out. Um, can you give an overview of the trilogy itself? Yeah, it's basically a trilogy about it. It's a revenge story in this kind of broken uh, steampunk, diesel punk world. Um, and the book genres kind of change for each one. The first one's almost more noir. The second one takes on a kind of more Western feel. Basically, there's the party of self-styled vigilantes trying to take down someone who has wronged them all and is uh, planning to do even worse things. Um, so it's both uh, trying to save the world, but also very deeply personal for each of them. Um, and it it is a kind of amalgamation of a lot of things I loved reading growing up. Uh, kind of intergenre of science fiction, fantasy, steampunk, post-apocalyptic fiction. Um, and that's basically it. Yeah, it's. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying writing it so far. I think it's been coming along well, and been working on the third one. So hopefully that will come out eventually. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's fun because you mentioned the first one's a little more noir, and in that, the main protagonist, Marcel, is a private investigator, so totally fits that noir vibe. And mm-hmm. then open, the, the second book opens in a bar with a, with a not yeah. that there's a couple scenes before that, but you know, there's a bar scene, they're playing cards. It's very Western. So, um, I like it. It almost has a bit of a firefly feel to it in terms of the the mix of Western and not space in this case, but kind of, you know, that science fiction. Yeah. The, the, I think I like the idea of there being a wilderness or a wild or, you know, not fully, um, not fully, I don't want to say like 
civilized land. And um, I, I, I say that warily because in the actual historical fiction, I feel like that's a problematic viewpoint. But from a narrative standpoint, in a fantasy world, it works very well. Um, and this kind of the post-apocalyptic fiction is kind of a, a way to imbue the world with a bit more uh, chaos to allow these kind of tales that are at the fringes of um, society that are less uh, beholden to law and order or that follow their own sense of law and order. Um, And the whole trilogy is kind of playing both of these genres, but also with kind of genre conceptions, how the characters view themselves within these stories. Both of my uh, protagonists, Marcel and Sylvain, are uh, interreading pulps, basically interreading, you know, like pulpy stories, even in universe. And that kind of can affect the way they view their own actions for better or for worse. And I do, I want to talk about Sylvain, especially um, in a little bit, because she is not your typical character. Um, I want to learn a little mm-hmm. bit more about writing her. But before we get there, can you talk about what inspired you to write this trilogy, the whole, you know, kind of, you have to create this world. So what was your initial jumping off point for inspiration? This is a, a world I've been creating. This is, um, I think a lot of, fantasy writer nerds might relate to having created fantasy worlds or sci-fi worlds or other kind of uh, settings in their head as a teenager. Um, At least that's what I did. And I was kind of building on it for years. And so it becomes almost hard to say exactly what it was inspired by because not because it's, I'm not going to pretend it's a wholly a hundred percent, out of the aether, no influences, but rather it's a whole bunch of influences of different things I was into um, at the time, both in fantasy and sci-fi, both in books and movies. Um, for this book specifically, I was trying to find a story to tell in this world. Um, and I had read Hyperion by Dan Simmons, um, which is based on the Canterbury Tales, but I'm a sci-fi fantasy nerd, so I didn't didn't read the classic literature. I read the, read the version that took place in space. Um, and he tells a story uh, about all these characters moving through this alien world on a quest together. But most of the story is kind of about why they're there and their own backstories. And the structure allowed him to talk about different parts of his world and different characters and different genres while still being in one coherent story. And that was initially the structural influence of my book. Now, if you read my book as it's been, you know, that was my 2016 draft. It's changed massively since then. And actually does follow slightly more of a uh, standard linear structure. But the elements of that were all built first as kind of trying to figure out why these different characters would come together on this quest, what would unite them. Um, And this uh, villain who uh, has managed to piss off so many people from so many diverse backgrounds. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit more about Marcel and Sylvain. What about them you might like as readers of this trilogy? Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or any where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar (laughs) 
Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with author Noah Lemelson. We are talking about the first two books in his Slick Dust trilogy. We, we, I gave you the uh, description of the first book, The Sightless City, uh, at the beginning of the episode. And now I'm going to go ahead and read you the description of the second book, which is called The Lioness and the Rat Queen. A city burning a murderous tycoon on the run, and three vigilantes out for revenge. Marcel never thought his investigations would lead to this. His once friend, Lazarus Roche, turned slaver and cruel puppet master. For the good of Wheel and to salve his conscience, Marcel must take Roche down, even if that means following him into the desolate and savage reaches of the wastes. Yet the tycoon is not the only waste folk with a past with Marcel. To find the tycoon, Marcel must break hardtack with an old enemy, a disgraced imperial general who he once had tried to kill, and is more more than eager to return the favor. Yet she is not the greatest threat in the wastes, for there is also a bounty hunter on his trail, the mysterious Queen of Rats, who somehow seems to know Marcel's every dark secret. So now you've had the description of both books, and we'll go ahead and get back to the interview with Noah. And... Let's talk a little bit more about Marcel and Sylvain as uh, the, the books are actually told from a few different viewpoints, but theirs mm-hmm. are the two that keep coming. You know, they're the main viewpoints. Um, give a little bit of background on each of them and what about them might resonate with readers. There are two characters who are uh, fairly different, but they're both united by being uh, wronged by the same man, by being betrayed. Um, and also their love for kind of uh, pulpy stories. Marcel is a character who wears a lot of hacks throughout his life. He's uh, tried to be an academic, then he became a soldier, then a private investigator, and by book two, he's a self-styled vigilante. Um, and he's someone who has a very strong moral sense, um, but can sometimes be blinded by the idea of something instead of what it actually is, if that makes sense. He's constantly trying to figure out who he is in almost his own story. He, he sees himself as he became a private investigator because he thought it was a way to do good, but it also became an ideal that he somewhat exaggerated and uh, try to live into, even though aspects of it didn't quite fit the reality around him. And that's kind of his constant struggle of um, trying to do the right thing, but being stuck by having these idealized versions of how the world is or should be that don't always match reality. Um, on a more on a more concrete level, because that's very high-minded, writer, abstract, um, He's a character who's suffered a lot for trying to do the right things and is trying to figure out how to navigate that. Um, He's lost friends. Um, He's had relationships break up due to uh, the events in the first novel. Uh, This this big war he was involved in that he uh, did acts that uh, were, depending on your point of view, either heroic or horrific. And he struggles with that kind of dichotomy of how to understand that. Um, Sylvain, on the other hand, is uh, requires some in-world explanation for some some of the terms. She's a feral, which is basically a in this world kind of like a beast person. They have sort of bestial characteristics, very hairy, um, sharp teeth, claws, all that good stuff. Um, and pharaohs are not usually treated all that well. They're kind of, um, depending on the part of the world, they're either disallowed from society, considered enemies of the state, or allowed, but tolerated and kind of, you know, trying to think that the right way to say it, it's society kind of patting themselves on their back for tolerating pharaohs. And that's a, that's an upbringing that has worn on her very deeply. And the way she has tried to process this, tried to process the, uh, 
discrimination she has faced is to try to be the least fairly feral, whoever it was. And that kind of blossomed into her love for engineering, which in the universe, um, in this world, engineering is not just a technical craft. It's uh, interwoven with what would be the equivalent of a magic system of aethermancy, where you literally can manipulate and infuse machines with uh, with features that would not be possible under normal physics. And it, her quest to become an engineer, to be kind of the most mechanically inclined, least, least bestial person she can be, uh, ends up getting her into a lot of trouble. Yeah, and she's, um, she's very different as a character because, you know, she, she is, she doesn't look like a human necessarily. And, you know, she's, she's got, um, these different characteristics, but she's also sometimes the easiest to relate to because she doesn't feel like she fits in. She's just trying to pursue what she is passionate about and meeting obstacles at every turn. So, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people would resonate with that as well. Yeah, yeah, I I found her. She was actually one of the easiest characters to figure out and find her voice because um, I think there we can all relate to having to being an outsider and to wanting to having something you want so very dear and it kind of defines your own sense of self and you know, struggling with that when that doesn't go your way and uh, when people even take advantage of that. Um, so I, I enjoy writing her quite a lot. Um, I think she's she's very fascinating and relatable. When it comes to writing characters, do you... What's your process? Do you like to have a really detailed character sketch before you start writing? Do you prefer to let them evolve as you write? Maybe a combination thereof. What works best for you? For me, I wrote all these characters. I wrote them as short stories first. Um, and kind of allowed that to be a first draft where I was working with each character to kind of figure out their deal. Um, so it's, it's a bit of both. It's, it's in microcosm. Um, but yeah, I do often find that you discover characters after writing your first draft and then you have to go back and, uh, adjust them to fit, fit what you've discovered about them. Um, I think all the characters have evolved in certain ways and, in the first draft, there were characters that I've since cut and taken aspects of them to fuse with other characters to give more depth. Um, I think Sylvain was the, the clearest to get going. Uh, Marcel took the most work to understand exactly what made him tick. Um, I had in an early draft with him, um, his um, girlfriend being murdered. Um, and that was going to be his motivation. And I had a, I had a beta reader who pushed back on that. Um, it was like, you know, these, these stories, they always have women being murdered as like a male, you know, uh, motivation. And she, she was like, do you really have to do that? And so I was forced to actually address this. And, um, not only did I discover that, yeah, that wasn't really a trope I needed to engage with but that the story became much, much more interesting if she didn't die, but left. And that, that changes Marcel's whole dynamic and how he views himself and how he um, sees his place in the world. Yes, because she left of her own agency, not of something outside of, ah, that like, yeah, yeah. I can see that would change a lot. Good job, beta reader. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, it was a very good note. Yeah. This, you know, when you write in this type of 
Well, when you write in this genre, let me just say that uh-huh. there, there's a lot of world building. So in this case, there's both world building and different kinds of characters that you get to create, which I imagine is a lot of fun, but probably provides some challenges. So how do you go about your your world building, your character creating, and how do you keep track of all of it? Yeah, so initially a lot of this was just kind of things in my head but I started just kind of writing down ideas just to keep them consistent and to not forget them. And I slowly started to build up documents. Um, And there isn't like a specific process I come. It's just, I'm someone who likes to kind of just sit around or walk around and think to myself. And uh, sometimes I just get, you know, into these long, musings um those can sometimes be generative um but i also take a lot from uh i'm really interested in reading history um and i find that inspires uh which makes sense inspires a lot both in kind of tone technology society um and i take bits and pieces to kind of fill out my world and it 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 doesn't take a hyper specific time period um which i think is actually true in a lot of fantasy and you know people say medieval fantasy um where they have plate mail and no gunpowder and it's like that 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 was never a time period that didn't exist um you're fusing elements from different time periods um and i do that too here it's kind of a mix of inspirations from the late 1800s into the early 20th century Um, just different um, ideas and concepts and political ideologies from this period that I can uh, weave my societies around and have the um, different factions have political differences that are a little more interesting than just good versus bad a little more relatable, for better or for worse. Let's go ahead and take our second break for this episode. When we come back, we'll be talking a little bit about history and writing a history of a world that you have created for a series like this. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Noah Lemelson. Let's return to that interview. And you mentioning history, I think, is a is a good point because we are coming into this in a a post-apocalyptic setting. We are at the end of our, you know, however much of an end you can be at of, of a very large war. So how much... How much of that did you have to have knowledge of in order to then write the the story? Because there is this big, there's a lot of history that goes into a world that you've made up. So how much of that are you cognizant of during the writing process? Quite a lot, actually. I've I've spent probably more time in some ways exploring the world before half of it got blown up than um, even the aftermath. Um, Because... One of the ideas is that 
you know, the past doesn't really die, that characters are still playing out the same conflicts, fighting over the same things, stuck with the same ideas that led them to destruction. Um, so that's, that's very, uh, deep part of my world building is making sure the world is built on another world and that world has to be, um, entirely fleshed out and make sense. Yeah, absolutely. It's always a little tricky to talk about series that are in progress because some Uh people have never heard of the series. Some people will have read the first book and not yet the second book. Some people will will have read both of them, maybe. Um, So you want to you don't want to give spoilers. (laughs) Um, Uh But can you talk a little bit about the progression from the first book to the second book and also give us give readers an idea of what they can expect in the third book, if possible? (laughs) Yeah, so the first book, and I might give a minor spoiler here, um, there, there's a character in book one called Lazarus Roach. Uh, not the nicest person, as it turns out, not the best, best individual. Um, and the first book kind of follows his plotting and actions and how that intersects with the uh, main point of view characters, as well as other characters who get uh, manipulated, used, tossed aside in his schemes. Um, and the first book is about trying to put an end to that. Um, and it ends in a partial success, partial complete disaster. And the second book is essentially the characters trying to fix what, fix the problems in the first book and, and, um, bring an end this whole conflict by uh, chasing him out into the wastelands and bringing him down. Um, But of course, things become far more complicated than that. And just as um, Lazarus's history is coming back to bite him, uh, each of the character's own past is coming back to haunt them, to harass them. Um, Just as they're hunting him, they are also being hunted. And it becomes that kind of... uh, very complicated, complicated game there. And the third book is still in process, but it's going to be these kind of final uh, confrontation, final culmination, um, even deeper into the waste beyond. If the first book is at the kind of edge of civilization, second book is kind of quite a little bit past that into wildlands. The, the third book is into basically the end of, you know, where even nature is giving out and the world is kind of collapsing. Um, And in this final place, they are going to have to try to do what they can to stop Lazarus's plans um, as they are coming to uh, completion, to fruition. Um, And it's going to take a, as hinted in the first two books, it's taking a kind of magical turn. Um, and is potentially going to be in bringing uh, a great evil into the world. And so it's going to be, I'm not entirely sure what genre to call it, but it's, it's, it's fitting that kind of like third book Lord of the Rings final battle kind of situation, you know? Um, the, the forces of evil and the forces of, I don't know if you call it good, but those who'd rather evil not succeed are finally going to come together in a, in a big explosive climax. As should happen in the third book of a trilogy. Cause you want closure. Um, the <laughs> middle book should leave you just feeling like, well, shoot. Now we're just stuck here uh, with all of this, but then you get that, that ending in the third. Um, what is it about the, Kind of a, it's kind of a soup of sci-fi, of fantasy, of steampunk. What, what is it about these genres that um, you enjoy writing within? I've always loved reading books that are kind of in between genres that are doing something interesting. Um, my main genre growing up, even though I tend to write more fantasy, uh, was sci-fi. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because it I like that it often dealt with very big, interesting ideas. 
but often I also had a perception of fantasy that it was much of it was stuck in kind of Tolkien's shadow. And that wasn't fully fair, but it also isn't fully unfair. Um, there's a lot of fantasy kind of defaulting to this kind of medieval setting. And I think some of the most interesting works of fantasy are those that break away from uh, using a medieval Europe as the default base. Um, and as uh, I was reading more and discovering more great fantasy, I got really into the works of like China Mieville, um, who's they sometimes called New Weird, um, but it's essentially just shows that you can do very creative and strange things um, with these these genres, um, and they don't have to be kind of separate entities. They 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 meet in a lot of places. Um, so I wanted to have the flexibility of a fantasy story as well as the ability to keep it kind of contained. One problem is if you have a, 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 a big space epic is suddenly you're now dealing with like planets and dozens of planets, hundreds of planets, and that can make, uh, that, that, that forces certain kind of stories to be told and other ones makes it harder. Um, I wanted to keep everything much more compressed, much more localized. Um, and I think the kind of early modern period, um, you know, of the 19, um, 1800s, 1900s, early 20th century is this period of such change. Um, often very, you know, we romanticize it, but there's often a lot of terrible aspects of that change. Um, but it's these kind of dealing with these idea, ideas of how society should be formatted in our relationship to the power of technology that shapes the modern world. And I was interested in those kind of ideas more than, say, you know, knights and, you know, chivalry or um, feudalistic ties. I wanted a story that addressed things that were a little more close to our world while still having these fantastical, magical elements, but that are understood in universe in a more scientific notion, just as we have applied a more scientific notion uh, to our understanding of our world as time has gone on. Mm -hmm. And one thing I love about, as I was listening to you and you mentioned new weird, uh, one thing I love about mm -hmm. books and publishing right now is that authors are not constrained to a single genre. Publicists and publishers still don't always know how to publish those. And, you know, they're, they still like those boxes, but authors are really, breaking out of those boxes, creating new genres, combining genres. Um, it's also a challenge to then keep up with all those genres, figure out what people are talking about. <laughs> um, when I was looking at your your books, I saw steampunk, I saw diesel punk, I saw rust punk, which I'd never heard of. So can you talk a little bit about those three yeah. words that come to mind and what that means for you, what you think it maybe means to broader readers. Yeah. I've always struggled with genre labels uh, just because there's so much interesting things that can be done in between them or that doesn't quite fit into one category or another. Um, so I've, I've called it steampunk because it does fit a lot of aspects of that, of kind of, uh, you know, retro futurist um, invention, um, these these very elaborate, amazing machines. But I've also considered that diesel punk fits a bit more of its grimmer tone. Um, this is a world that's less puffing with, you know, beautiful white steam clouds and more, you know, smoke and grit and dust. Rust Punk is that I will fully admit I'm, I'm pretty sure um, it was either me or one of my uh, professors made that up. So we're, we're trying to push that. 
um, because that feels the most accurate to the setting. It's a world that is technologically advanced, but also decaying. So, you know, which of those categories or all three it should fall into, I'll I'll leave to readers to decide. Um, At some level, I'm kind of of the belief that genre labels are the librarian's job. You know, you you write what you write, um, and then you figure out the best way to explain it. Oh, poor librarians! <laughs> I know. I I say that my dad was a librarian, so I can only imagine him the look on his face right now. Um, it's time for our final break of this episode, but actually, I'm I'm really wishing my dad were still alive right now, so that I could talk to him about this series and or this trilogy, and talk to him about steampunk and this genre um, and it's it's many different variations in this genre i'm not sure he ever read steampunk if he i mean he loved that movie the wild wild west you know that was steampunk right um but did he ever read it i don't know the answer to that he loved fantasy and science fiction and now oh it's one of those conversations that we aren't going to have and i would have liked his opinion but and i would have liked to hear how he described a trilogy like this because he was a k-12 librarian so described this to some of his students Ah, lost opportunities anyway um when we come back we'll be talking a little bit about the third book in the trilogy that noah is currently working on stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back the golden state media concepts travel podcast the show that gives you advice on everything travel we explore places you've always wanted to go as well as giving tips for traveling in those places we'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips information and discounts join us as we travel the world explore cultures and meet new people the golden state media concepts travel podcast has got you covered Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Noah Lemelson. So are you, you're currently working on the third novel in the trilogy, is that correct? Yes, it's been, uh, the start's been a bit slow, but I am very slowly getting into it. Um, you, and I am looking forward to it. Do you have a, a timeline for readers so they have an idea of when they might expect it? I don't want to put anything into words that I might live to regret. Um, the last book took a couple of years, so I'm, I'm hoping, like, I'm trying to think, two, three years. I'm hoping that this one will also be like that, um, or on the shorter, shorter end, but I will not know until I'm deeper in. Um, but hopefully, I, I, the one thing I don't want to do is, um, as much as we love George R. R. Martin, um, I, I do not want to be that guy. I I don't like unfinished things, so it's going to weigh on me more than anyone else uh, until I get this thing done. So I am on it, but it must take a minute. Fair enough, and thank you for that. I've, there's a series I've been reading for 30 years, and I just want some freaking closure at this point. <laughs> Just get it done, you know? Yeah, it's, I'm kind of over okay. the whole thing, but I want to know how it ends. So I will finish it. But so biology, history, you've talked a lot about um, your interests. What was your impetus that made you decide to write for publication? It wasn't like a one moment. It's I loved writing as a teenager, but I only was doing a little bit kind of in screenwriting. And it was just something that kind of kept growing and growing. Like through college, I'd write a little bit more, try to get into creative writing classes. And after college, I was like, oh, I have some time. I can take more creative writing classes. And the more I did that, the more I'm like, 
I think this is kind of what I want to do. Um, I, I love, I love and respect research, but I realized I was not a researcher that requires a very specific skill set, which I don't, uh, tell you about when you're studying in school. Um, and I realized that a lot of the same ideas I was interested in science were coming out through my writing. Um, so I decided to take a risk on that, to, to move into writing. And um, I'm very grateful that my, my family has been very supportive of that. And that's helped me uh, financially be able to do that um, since writing is not the most, you know, writing in the indie space is not always the most lucrative of career choices, but it's something that's brought me a lot of joy. And so I found ways to move my life around to allow me to do that. Um, so there was, there wasn't a single moment. It's more of just a growth of my interest in reading um, and writing um, until it got to the point that I just kind of had to accept that this is what I wanted to do. Sure. Do you have any tips or advice for people who think they might, who are at that point where they might want to write, but they're not fully sure yet. Yeah. I mean, the, the advice is very boring, but it's straightforward. It's you read, you write, and you try to find other people who are interested in writing and find some community in them. Um, That could be a writing class. That could be a writing workshop. I've been in the same workshop with people I've known for seven years, something like that. I'm not sure exact number, but it's been a while. Um, and I think we often think of writing as a very solo thing, but I, I think it's something that absolutely benefits or even for some people, for me at least, requires uh, finding community. Um, but there's no, you know, unfortunately, there's no tricks to it. Uh, if you want to be a good writer, you read and you write. And if it's not great as it starts, you just keep doing it and it starts to get a little bit better. Absolutely. Yes. How about reading? When you take the time to read just for you, who are your favorite authors and your favorite genres? So I love sci-fi, fantasy, horror, anything strange, speculative, new, weird, slipstream whatever subgenre you want. Um, definitely growing up, my big ones were uh, sci-fi. Um, def- some fantasy too as well. I, you know, like everyone, I, I read Harry Potter. Though I will say after I read Harry Potter, I read the Bartimaeus sequence, which I actually think is doing similar things, but a lot more interesting. If you ever have a chance to check that one out. Um, but and it's Jonathan Stroud. Um, but first, for uh, sci-fi, which was my main go-to, um, I love Dinosaur Lem, Ursula Le Guin, Octavia Butler. Um, my dad got me really into Robert Heinlein, who has some interesting viewpoints, but it is he does write some interesting stuff. Um, recently, I got into Jeff Vandermeer in China Mieville, uh, Brian Evanson in horror. So... Those tend to be my my biggest influences, but I try to read from a variety of. Oh, and I shouldn't mention I never never give proper credit here, but like Terry Pratchett, I you know I love Discworld and um, and uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is Pratchett, but it's in a similar space. Yes, I always have a towel with you. Um. Yes, exactly. <laughs> internet presence in case people want to know more about you and the books uh, if you have a website please give that and then any social media that you're active on uh, my website is noahlemelson.com uh, n-o-a-h-l-e-m-e-l-s-o-n um, and my twitter is at n lemelson um, i'm also part of the sword fights and space flight um, list host um, so you can look that up, and that has a variety of indie sci-fi fantasy authors, uh, news from them, but also uh, really interesting, fun articles, publishing tips, essays, and more. So look up Sword Fights and Space Flights, and you can sign up for that as well. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Noah, we've talked about a few things, but is there anything that we have not covered that you want to make sure you highlight during our time together? That's that's mostly it. It's, you know, like all things, I, I tend to find you only figure out if you love something if you check it out. Um, it's sometimes hard for me to tell before uh, reading a book whether or not it's going to be close to my heart. So uh, not just me, but I, I always recommend people to just read wild, you know, widely to try new things because um, you never know what's going to be meaningful to you. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for taking the time out of your day to talk to me about the trilogy and writing. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you once again to Noah for joining me for this episode. I enjoyed talking to him. I feel like I learned about the steampunk, diesel punk, rust punk, whatever other kinds of punk there are. What did he say? New weird? Something about something like new weird weird. Anyway, there there's a lot of new genres, and I love that because I get to learn all the time about things that I I'm not that familiar with. And so, if you are a fan of sci-fi fantasy, post-apocalyptic, steampunk, any of the things that we talked about in this episode, you definitely want to check out this trilogy. There are two available. Uh, you're going to have to wait for the third one, but you can read the first two and get an idea of the trilogy. And like Noah said, you never know what you're going to like until you try it. So if it sounds at all intriguing, you should definitely check it out um, and see what you think. And if you do read it, let me know what you think. I love hearing from listeners, as I say every episode, and I love to know what you're reading. And if you've read some of the books with the authors that I featured on the podcast, um, love hearing from you. So uh, as always, I say you can find the podcast on social media. That's Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, and Instagram. Someday I might start remembering to call it X, but I never do in the moment. Uh, Facebook, X, TikTok, and Instagram. You can find the podcast on those. Of course, if you are have not done so already, you can leave a review on the platform on which you listen. That is really, really helpful to get this podcast out to more listeners. You can also um, like, subscribe, follow on that same platform so that you are always notified of new episodes. Speaking of new episodes, I should, of all things go well this coming weekend, have two new interviews for you next week. The first of which is uh, a father-daughter duo, Marty Olyout, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, and Grace Lee will be talking about their memoir, A Tent for Seven. Is it A Tent for Seven or just Tent for Seven? Just Tent for Seven. A camping adventure gone south out west. It... <laughs> It's quite the adventure and um, very amusing. I'm very much looking forward to talking to them. And then I'll be speaking with another author, but I'll tell you about that at the end of the next episode. I can't give everything away, but join me for next week's episodes and we'll be we'll, we're switching up in genres. So we've got a memoir and then um, a kind of action adventure thriller uh, for the second interview. I hope you're having a great week and I hope that that week is... Um, well, it's fulfilling in many ways, but that especially gives you plenty of time to get yourself lost in a good book. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.